Okay. Also. Okay. So as you all know, because this is a public meeting, that everything will be recorded. And uh, first review is, uh, is there anyone present from the public that has been advised they can uh, speak now? No, okay. So let's move on to uh, the approval of the minutes uh, from January 20th. Assuming everyone has had a chance to review them. Is there any discussion? Motion to okay. approve. Motion to accept. Tom, okay. Uh, second. Second, okay. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Aye. Done. Okay. Moving on. Welcome, Chief. You're on mute right now. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Okay. Thank you so much for being with us. We're all looking forward to it. I know you've got rave reviews from other uh, commissions and committees you sat on. Uh, I also serve on the Veterans Commission, so I did speak to you there with two of your uh, uh, lieutenants uh, or sergeants. So we are looking forward. Um, welcome. Welcome to Weathersfield. I know you hit the ground running. And uh, uh, we will. We can ask questions uh, as we go along. Uh, raise your hand if you want to ask the chief a question. But uh, tell us all what's going on. Well, we have a lot going on in, in the town. You know, I've only I go on for three months now being here, and it's uh, it's we are going to move this agency forward. Um, we have a lot of great men and women in the police department who are here, who are community service oriented, and now we're going to empower them to do their jobs. And they're going to come out, and they're going to see us out there, and our faces out there in the community, or we're gonna meet with everyone, and you know, pretty much is what can the police department do for our community. Is what I'm looking for. You know, I'm meeting with the department heads. I, I met with Mike and I met with various others and figure out how we can work together. What is it do you need from us and what can we do for you and vice versa to build that partnership? Because uh, that's what it's about. It's about the town of Wellesfield and how we all can work together. So um, there's a lot going on. So the best way is I would suggest is you just ask me questions because I can go on forever or, you know, you could. And give me specifics that you're looking okay. to talk about. All right. Well, let, let's talk about police training because from an insurance point of view, uh, you see workers' comp claims, mm -hmm. and I know that they need to go through rigorous training. Uh, there's no question about that. They need to do that. But uh, in the past, there have been some uh, uh, claims during, uh, workers' comp claims during training, which is supposed to be realistic, I guess. Mm -hmm. But can you talk about safety and whether you're doing some really heavy duty training, not just at the range, but you know, uh, stuff that involves physical um, situations where they may be physically injured. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you're well aware of that. Police are a high li liability profession. We all know that um, from training to, and we say training, there's various types of training. And you know, we're a heavily mandated profession as well through laws. So when we're talking training, there's a couple of areas that we're referring to when you talk about workers' comp claims. And that's more your physical training. When we do our, our you know, tactical training for our SWAT teams or we do our in-service training for um, defensive tactics training, as I would put it, um, from the different levels from hands-on to using a taser to using OC spray um baton and then to the firearm so when we do the, and even handcuffing you have to train for handcuffing how to properly handcuff someone so he talks about these types of training and the environment they're in you try to train as realistic as possible but we know you have to feel it back because we don't want our officers getting hurt and we're not going to sit there and roll around the ground you know use when you're doing training with the baton you use the um the mats or the big old, old punching bags to strike and things of that nature um so i think when it comes to that type of training and, and workers comp it's how often do we train is the question like anything else if you don't train all the time you lose it use it or lose it so when you're asked to train once a year and it's like you know it's like telling me, okay, chief, go run three miles today when I haven't ran in a year. I probably make it a block. 
and then I'll pull a hamstring along the way. <laughs> so that's the way you have to look at it as, you know, what are we doing to make sure that we are physically and mentally fit to keep up with the times? And it's, it's, there's just not enough time in a day and in, in a week to make sure there's wellness programs that we have for, that they can do on their own to make sure they're staying fit to do these types of activities. I mean, it's bad enough when it happens in a real world environment when we have to go hands on with an individual. But in training in a controlled environment, it's, it shouldn't happen, but it still does happen. Um, or so, I mean, it, but do I see it frequently? No. I haven't seen it here. The larger departments like Hartford, I really didn't see it. State police, I saw it occasionally. So you'll see it occasionally. And I think you have to weigh in, you know, age and physicality of the person who's doing it. Okay. Okay. Uh, just kind of going back to notes and stuff from past meetings. I know we had some discussions on um, the, the use of drones and, um, and I guess I want to bring in Chris too, because um, I don't know, I mean, I may have missed something, but are we kind of together with what the town's liability, how we're using the drones and whether or not that liability is covered, Chris? So maybe the chief can speak about how they're using them. And, you know, Chris, if you can just kind of give the committee back some information as to whether or not you know, you feel that we're sufficiently covered for any liabilities on those. That sounds great. And uh, Chief uh, Medina, I'm Chris Wardrop, waving my hand so you know who I am. I'm uh, an advisor on the risk management, the property liability side of things. So if you see my name, that's it. But please, <laughs> please go first if you would like to. Um, and at any time, if you want me to weigh in, uh, I would be happy to as well. Um, well, speaking of drones, what's the biggest issue that comes across with drones? The biggest push is a violation of Fourth Amendment right um, to privacy. And that's really been settled already with the courts. That drones aren't flying through your bedroom window; they're not staring through the window, hovering there. They're usually high access um, on points of view. Uh, but the town of Weathersfield only has one right now. Um, with that, they're very heavily mandated through the FAA. You have to license through them. I mean, even when we put a drone up in the air, we have to call Bradley and ask for permission to put that drone in the air. So it's not like it's something that's just like, oh, we just buy it, Radio Shack and put it up in the air and we have a drone. It's heavily regulated. There's a lot of federal laws that, that are regulations that we have to follow with that and a specific instance that we do it. I mean, you could do it during a parade, you could do it during a high risk search, um, but we're not gonna put a drone up in the air just to fly it. That, that does not occur. There has to be a specific reason. So. When it comes to liability of a drone, and that's already been in Hartford when I was there, we went through that with the NAACP um, they were fighting against the drones and they realized that they're more of a tool, they're an asset. Because when I can send a drone into an area and not put a physical body there and have eyes on a scene, I would rather do that and lose a drone than lose an officer through injury or you know workers comp claim that's going to cost the town more where I could put a drone up in the air, see from a distance where we don't, you won't even see it. I, I mean, you can't see it. There. They go up really high and have great views. Um, and it works, it's actually a, a better tool. A better tool for the department as a whole. So I'm looking forward to getting more drones. I only have one that I want to enhance our drone program, but it's heavily regulated. It's a lot of policies that, that go along with it. And like I said, being certified through the FAA, FAA to fly it. And that's not cheap. It's like $800 per certification and a very stringent exam that they do take. So only certain people can fly the drones. Individuals can fly it, I should say. Um, and, and just to, to tag on to what Chief Medina said, um, and, and I'll give him some serious credit for the way he said what he said. The FAA regulates the skies. They are, they are the starting point. Um, and ironically, the FAA also is the key underwriting, you know, question. And so the way it works is um, the current carrier Kerma has a pretty seamless ability to add aircraft liability coverage for drone operation based upon there being FAA certifications and the proper training. And depending on the type and size drone, like there were some DJI Phantoms that 
between the um, the accessory package, sometimes thermal imaging cameras and things like that, you're pushing ten to twenty thousand dollars. So there's actually the ability to add physical damage coverage as well. But um, you know, it, it's we did a lunch and learn at USI back in 2017 on this subject, and actually had a law enforcement um, a person from the town of Vernon flying a drone in our parking lot. Um, but what was interesting is just this past week, there was news about the town or the city of Chicopee, Massachusetts, acquiring an underwater drone, which will be used for search and rescue operations in two of the rivers, including the Connecticut River. So as we think about drones, it's obviously above the ground, but as we will see, some engineering firms have it, it's actually underwater applications as well. So, um, you know, in uh, Chief Medina, at any point, if there's ever a need to consult about the drone operations or whatnot, we are we are certainly open open to doing so. Thank you. Awesome. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Good. That was a great question, Doc. I, I think on that point, uh, I think uh, the Chief made a good point that using drones in, in, in places where you would otherwise be using a physical, physical officers or even, you know, you could see chasing uh, vehicles with, uh, with vehicles as, as opposed to having a drone go up high and, and watch where those vehicles are going. You're, you're avoiding potential loss and liability uh, using that drone as opposed to human resources, I guess. It's, probably the best way to put it. So it's another way of looking at it. Chief, could you talk about where the fine line is between stopping a vehicle for a taillight or a headlight versus uh, not having a license plate in the front and, and progressing up to where's the fine line between being sensitive to stopping uh, motor vehicles for very, very minor violations. And obviously they're the ones when you run a step uh, a red stop light. So how do you feel about, you know, where to apply the law equitably across all drivers? That's it's a sensitivity that. issue for certain groups of drivers. Well, that's, that's a, when you speak about the law, it's either or. It's either you have a broken taillight or you don't have a broken taillight. Uh, you're asking me about the enforcement of the law, and you're asking me about the discretion. Yes, thank you. Of, you're asking about Correct. the discretion of the officer. At what point do we go away from the low hanging fruit, I should say, of a busted taillight and saying pulling someone over for that, and issue them a verbal warning or a warning and say, "Hey, take your car and get it fixed." compared to is that going to engage us in a pursuit, which is now going to bring liability upon a town if we continue with the pursuit, which you shouldn't because we don't pursue for those type of violations anymore. That, that, that's, that's gone by the wayside of policing. That's the old standard of policing. Uh, the new standard is more violent crimes, known criminals, serious criminals, off offenders. Um, pursuits don't end well. They don't end well for anyone. Um, end up in a crash. Somebody crashes, that's how they usually come to a conclusion. And you have damage to a, a police cruiser, you have injury to an officer, you have injury to the person. Um, there's a whole lot, host of liabilities when it comes to pursuits. So enforcing those low hanging violations is two sides to the story. We enforce them, we hopefully prevent crime from escalating to a higher level. If you don't enforce them, are you inviting a higher level level of crime into the town? It's a balancing act. Um, and that's where, you know, I look to is getting the officers back out in the community, more face-to-face -face contact with the community and building intelligence through face-to-face -face relations. Um, there's always gonna be motor vehicle violations. There's gonna be cars that are registered. The biggest thing, if we do decide to stop them and they take off on us or they proceed to try to engage us in a pursuit, we let them go. If we have the video of the license plate, we always go back to the warrant if the car is properly registered. If the car is not properly registered, then you know it's a misuse, uninsured, um, and it's that or it's stolen. 
and you really have no avenue at that point, but you let them go and no one gets hurt. You live for another day. So uh, that's the new way of policing, I should say. But so the question you're asking is, it's, it's you get a lot of avenues on that one. But the safest way for risk management, let them go. Okay. I, I know that every, every guy has a different perspective on it in terms of how deeply they enforce things. But you know, again, it's an issue I think that every town has to face uh, when you are uh, that kind of thing. You know? I was, I mean, I've been on the for 26 years. I came into this policing, the age of policing, that's totally different than what it is now. But as anything else, as society progresses, we have to progress. So it really comes down to what's the community looking for, for from its police department. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, getting more involved with the community. Uh, and I noticed that new donut shop on the South East Highway has uh, uh, something with police. Uh, that was in the paper a couple of weeks ago. Uh, have, have a cup of coffee with an officer. Uh, mm -hmm. What kind of things in the towns specifically will get your officers in front of citizens uh, more often than just being in their cruisers? Well, it starts with me, attending meetings and committee meetings and being out there. I'm, I'm trying to get out and meet as many people as possible across the town and set the example. These are my expectations. Um, policing is not just about stopping cars. It's about being a part of the community, having the community, community understand what we do. And that means parking your car, getting out, walking and talking to business leaders, stopping at the gas station, at the restaurant, and being out and engaging with the community. Because quite frankly, that also leads to solvability of crimes or prevention of crimes in the town because the community knows what's going on in the town. They probably know more about me than they know about the community right now because I'm sure everybody's been trying to read up on it. Um, to see what I'm at. But if you have the officers engaged with the community, uh, an individual who might have been fearful of the police a month or two ago has built a rapport with a certain officer, might pick up the phone and say, hey, this is going on in the corner of this and that, and helps us engage the community better. Um, so that's what I foresee. So it's both out engaging, but it's also still fighting crime. So it's not, we're not getting away from enforcing laws and doing what we're supposed to be protecting and serving. So just doing it a different way. Kelly, you're on mute. Um, I had a question in regards to, I know there's been some conversation uh, around um, having the uh, SROs in the, um, in the schools. Do you foresee any um, uh, possibility in the future that that could become an issue, that um, that would be something that, um, it, it, you know, would would change. I'm, I'm qualifying that with saying I, having been on the, the board for six years and especially when the program, you know, when, when it was first started, um, from my point of view, I saw a lot of success from it, you know, and because you had some really good staff there, um, you know, who've connected with the kids and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, so uh, where do you see that going at this point? For our town, I hopefully foresee that we remain in the schools. The first point of contact to the community and our kids is an officer in the schools. Someone they can trust, you know, that build that rapport what they see every day and they're not afraid of someone in a uniform. You know, I know there's some, uh, angst about having police officers in schools because they're in a uniform and they don't want to make it seem like it's militaristic. Um, I don't agree with that. Now, we used to, I grew up in a world of officer friendly, someone you can trust. When you pull that away, you lose that. And the last time, the last, the, the one point we don't want to interact with a, with a child or a young adult is when they're in a time of need. If you interact with them prior to that in a controlled environment, like a school setting where you build that report and they trust you, they'll come up and talk to you. They'll come up to officer friendly, like we've always been known, and say, hey, I can't talk about this with my parents, but this is going on at home. It's not just in the schools. And if you could build that, that, that gap between the two and even inspire one or two to come into this profession, then you won. Because realistically, as police officers, we really don't know who we've touched until 20 years from now saying, I remember you officer so-and-so, you did this or did that for me. 
we don't know. Um, those are the things we don't hear about. You hear about the negative things, so you never hear about the positive. Because um, like say bad news sells. Um, but the good news is like when one kid says, you know, I changed my way because I sat down and spoke to officers, so and so and on. And this is what I did. And this is why I want to be a police officer. That's when you know you may change your life. Um, so taking them out of schools, separating the two, now makes it harder for us to engage them. Right? We're trying to institute different programs to engage the youth of this community. Um, and we have to catch them when they're younger. But if we don't, then what happens if we don't catch them when they're younger? Then now they become an issue as they get older if they haven't been, had that, that guidance or that mentorship. And then we have to deal with them at a different type of level, which I'd rather deal with them when they're younger. Okay, thank you. Uh, it, yeah, is part, is part of that training um, for the SROs um, knowing when to hand something off so that, you know, I mean, I, again, you go back to the liability issue of, you know, somebody, you know, with all good intentions trying to help and something down the road happens because, you know, they miss the opportunity to hand it to the right, to the right resource that's needed. I mean, is that part of the SRO training? I mean, and, you know, besides being able to talk to the kids and so forth, but knowing when to say, you know, we really need to shift gears here a little. And that's, that's a team approach between the Board of Ed, youth, youth and Social Services, and the Police Department. We all have to work together. So it's a team effort when something's brought to an officer's attention, it's spoken to as a group, obviously with confidentiality involved. So that way everyone's on the same page. It's not just beholden upon us. Because as we know, police officers are jack of all trades and experts of none. We're physicians, we're doctors, we're psychologists. Sometimes we might be a lawyer. Um, Mike is trying to turn me into a finance guy with the budget. Um, so, you know, we are the jack of all trade in the master, like I said. So we need that support from the community, other resources who are the experts. But if we're that initial trust fact that someone can break the ice with us and get us to understand where to come from, then we can reaffirm. So it's not about resting our way out of a problem, it's helping our way out, out of an issue or helping them out of an issue. And we do find out, the find the resources for them or the person to talk to. So in, for in, in these services. And part of the training is, as an SRO, is to know when that should happen? Yes. Okay. How's your staffing levels, Chief? Oh, I'm sorry, Carly, go ahead. No, I just was um, uh, clarifying. I remember when the program was, um, you know, first initiated and an agreement was signed um, with the Board of Ed, um, you know, an, um, um, MOA was signed uh, with the with the Board of Ed, and I think there it made a provision for a specific type of ongoing training uh, to for the individuals who are in that in that pos or in those positions um, that so that they would continue with that. They're not just there no. uh, willy nilly. They've been. Um, they've been vetted for it and they are going through specific training and there's they're specifically assigned um, for, you know from and that's been that was my understanding so um, and it seems to have worked pretty well as far as from my point of view I haven't been on the board for a couple of years but um, you know I know we were all pretty comfortable with it Sorry, Frank, that was just a... No, 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 no that's fine, that's fine. Uh, your staffing levels, Chief? Information. <laughs> um, my staffing levels, when I first took on the, this position uh, almost three months ago, we were down seven. Um, as of today, we should be down one. Oh. Uh, but I'm expecting two retirees to come in April, so I'll be back down three. Um, but down three compared to seven is is, is a move in the right direction um, so we're doing pretty good and, and we're fortunate because we're a town that's sought after so i have the ability to be very selective on who i hire for this department um, so it's been working out very well the last couple months 
Other questions? I I've just one more. Go ahead, Sally. I, 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 just, I have one more, and that was regarding the um, uh, the the uh, decision that the town has to make in regard to um, the the moratorium is um, is I think ending as far as uh, retail marijuana um, establishments being permitted. Uh, can you comment, Kemma? Who can you comment on that? Uh, you know how you what your position is on that. Um, I spoke on that in the council meeting uh, a month ago, and what my position was. Um, my question to the council and everyone else is: Do the benefits outweigh the cost? Um, with the type of establishment, the retail version of it. Um, calls for more training on the part of my staff to identify drug related offenses um, and additional staff to deal with the, uh, the pedestrian and vehicular traffic that is going to draw to the town. Um, so that's where I, I, my, my opinion of that is. Okay. Thanks. Uh, early on, you talked about the progression of uh, dealing with the situation. Uh, we don't have a canine team in this town. Is that something that's shared with towns? We actually have. We have up until last week, we had two canines. We just uh -huh. retired one last week, so I'm down to one canine right now. So we do have one canine team um, for our town. So we're going to see where that goes in the future. Um, you know, obviously with now marijuana being legalized, that's one less use for a canine. Um, no longer can it have dogs that are there trained to, to, to detect marijuana because it's illegal. And a lot of our canines who have been cross-trained in narcotics detection were cross-trained in our, uh, marijuana. So that's kind of almost made them ineffective right now. So you have to look at the newer dog that's coming online and what they're gonna be trained in. Um, so that's another additional expense and the liability of having a canine as a patrol dog for um, um, apprehension of uh, criminals. So that's a that's a new a new front for policing as we move forward. You can, I think you might see the whole way of the canine change. Hmm. You, you bring the, uh, the dog and the trainer to uh, schools, uh, middle schools, and high schools for demonstrations. I'm sorry, you were broken up. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Do you do, do you bring the canine and its uh, handler to schools to demonstrate uh, their ability to obey, obey commands, things like that? You can upon request. Yes. Yes, they're they're taught to do do the aggressive side and the the uh, uh, promotional side. So they are trained to be around crowds, around people and handle themselves accordingly, but still be able to do their job on the other side. Um, it's an ongoing training. You know, the dog's only as good as the handler. Uh, if the handler doesn't train them, the dog's gonna be of no use. So that's where the effectiveness of a canine comes in. You need a good handler and a good dog to make a great team. If one or the other lacks, then that, that, that team is not gonna be useful. Does the dog wear a vest? Um, we don't, unless it's donated or purchased, our dogs do not wear vests. Yeah. Well, the marketing side of me says that's uh, the kind of program that you can rally community support around to uh, raise funds for uh, the care. I mean, I've, I've supported you know, other organizations uh, who have um, had vests for their dogs. Well, how, how much does a vest run? I don't know. I'd have to. Use, I'm assuming around five thousand or so, but I'm not, don't quote me on it. Well, actually, you know what? I can't say that. Our bulletproof vest calls cost about eight hundred to a thousand, so I would say probably in the same range for a cleaner. But I don't know. I haven't. I haven't purchased one. Okay, so you need to have funding for that, which is probably not in your budget. Is that what I'm hearing? That would be more out of funding. Like I'm sure a lot of vests, a lot, that would become from fundraising. A lot of bulletproof vests for dogs would come through fundraising or donation. Um, if I were to purchase it, yes, I would have to incorporate it in my budget for the canine. Interesting thought. We can think about that offline. But, uh, 
feel free to struggle about stuff like that. Uh, body cams for officers. Uh, are they wearing body cams now? Oh, they are. They're wearing body cams. That's that's a must. And anytime we have contact with the community, like body cameras should be on and worn in capturing video. Okay. Any other questions for the chief? Because I found this fascinating. So. <laughs> no, it's it's good. It's all good stuff. It really is. You're right. This is a good town to be in. Oh, it's a great town. You got, you got a lot of support from the community. I suspect, so. Appreciate it. Any other questions for the chief? All righty. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your time you take with us and, and share your thoughts and ideas and where the town is moving forward and, and uh, with the Steel PD. And uh, it's, it's going to be good for you guys. It's going to be good for us. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Any uh, questions? You know, you know, you know, me. Um, and if if you want to if you want to donate money to the PD, talk to Mike. He's right here on the call. <laughs> you well, figure out what that's, that's, I gotta tell you, for me. this is where I can draw from. <laughs> that one sticks in my throat. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's a that's a way to get the community support with uh, the dogs back. So, yeah, but not, I'm not gonna let that one go. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Care, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. All right, Chief, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. It's probably, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I can stand, right? Well, you know, you have to be really sensitive about uh, the questions and, and because of situations that have happened in the past, you know, uh, and liability issues. But you can tell this guy is really ramped up. I mean, he, he really is the real deal. He knows what he's talking about. I mean, you know, it just it feels real good. So, moving on. To other things, who's up first? And it's Chris Wardrop. Thank you very much. I know. Right. Go. All right, you got it. I think I've got a little echo, but I'll keep plowing forward here. Um, the first agenda item is the insurance budget and uh, just renewal activity update. Uh, here we are on February 17th. The March towards July 1st continues. Um, where we are today is we have some decent certainty that the rate indications, and this is very, very, very early compared to what most municipalities are able to get at this point, but um, between that lap package policy and the workers' compensation policy, just on pure rate, not exposure change, but we already have some indications that are in that zero to three percent range. Uh, I'm working closely with Ashley Rita of Kerma. She's working very closely with her team. And um, what we'll do is we'll progress with, with more refinement around the numbers. So I'll be working with Mike um, as well as Matt on you know, renewal information alongside the carrier as we make our way through the springtime. Um, but at this point in time, you know, things are in a good place as we measure peer group, as we take a look at the claims activity, um, both on a property liability side and the workers' comp. So we're doing that. We also look at the ancillary lines. Uh, we already have cyber coverage in place that does not renew July 1st. So that's a really good thing. Um, so we just maintain forward momentum on, on the, uh, the insurance renewals and how it connects to the budget, uh, which I know Mike is in the midst of right now um, with some help from Chief Medina, apparently. Um, so, so anyway, that's that. Any questions on that first agenda item? Okay. So uh, letter B, other risk management and insurance activities. Uh, the first one I wanted to open up with is just some feedback from you. How did you feel last month's session with Kerma providing the, their report on how things are going for them, some of the things that they look at? Um, any any feedback there? Because we're we're continuing to, you know, work on ways to improve um, those types of reports, make them effective. And uh, I just thought I would open it up in case anybody has any any feedback um, that we can relay, or we can wait till next month or the following month when uh, there may be a Kerma representative at this uh, committee meeting. Oh, 
Paul, you were going to say something. I can tell you were thinking. Go ahead. Uh, no, I just I, I feel like uh, having the Kerma people come in every once in a while is is obviously very helpful to all of us. And, and I, they, I missed the person answer the question straight. Yeah. I missed the personal interaction from previous years. I think you know it's uh, that's that, that's the handicap we have with these stupid Zoom meetings. Uh, yeah. When you're physically a mono a mono or female version, uh, it's just better. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point, Frank. Uh, in fact, I had a conversation with somebody earlier today and you know, the virtual world that we're in uh, has some positives that obviously it allows people in a very convenient setting to be available, sometimes review on a different monitor, different reports when they're talking. So it's kind of a real time type of analysis. But just like you said, there's a lot missing uh, with personal interaction, relationship building. Being able to see somebody, see gestures, see body language, and, and all those different things. So, yeah, it's it's definitely different. But um, hey, you know what? If we're glass half full, maybe as we go week to week here, and we end up with some warmer weather, and um, you know, some some uh, good responsible people, we'll we'll end up in a better places locally and literally across the country. So, uh, that's that. Um, so thank you for that. That's that's great. And again, what I'll do in, in behind the scenes, a few months before that actual session or that meeting, um, I'm working with Mike and Matt, and, and we're working to develop an agenda to use as a guide, you know, to basically share with Kerma as a guide. You know, what are some of the things that we think you would want to know that's going on? So we'll continue to do that. I appreciate it. Um, just in terms of a couple other things that are uh, maybe of note in terms of other risk management activities. Uh, back in uh, around January 21st, um, I did uh, with Kathy Crooker, my colleague, uh, a resource review for Claudia in Human Resources. Uh, Mike was part of it as well. And, and the whole idea there is to look at USI's resources that are part of our contract, that are part of what we deliver to all of our clients, but how ties to helping a public sector human resource professional. Uh, to give you an example, we have a hotline called Safety 911, where either I on your behalf or Claudia or anybody else can send this email to this one address and it's staffed by four USI loss control uh, consultants. And uh, we've actually tapped that once or twice for Weathersfield over the past few years, uh, but that's one example. Uh, another example is our risk management center. It's an online portal, but it has an entire human resources component to it. Uh, it. It has some training. It has ask technical questions. It's a way to build job descriptions. Uh, it, there's, a, there's a huge amount of resources. So I think Claudia found that to be very informative. Uh, so that was a, that was a, a helpful thing. Uh, but another one that I wanted to mention is that USI and in, in, in both, you know, Mr. Monroe here, as well as myself, see this every single week, as USI continues to develop education and training through a webinar format. And there's one coming up that it kind of piqued my interest in uh, on March 16th at 1130 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. There's going to be a webinar by some USI specialists on establishing cyber incident response plans. Um, this one came out with some invitations about a week ago and regionally it has already broken records for RSVPs in attendance. Um, it's amazing what is happening. And I mention this for a few reasons. Number one, Mike and I talk about cyber risk. He already does have with the town a cyber response plan I, in, in the forum of this meeting. We're not going to go into any details about that, but he does continue to refine that. But this, this type of incident response plan is built on modern approaches. It's built on case studies. And it's one that we are inviting all of our clients, including Weathersfield to. But what I also wanted to do is invite this committee. Um, uh, Frank, as, as chairman, I remember, I think it was maybe three or four years ago, that I mentioned about one type of, it was a lunch and learn that I was, um, that I was overseeing and managing. 
And I remember you having an interest in saying, hey, I would like to attend that. And so spearheading or, or kind of a springboard off of that one, I did want to offer that if anybody would like to attend a USI webinar on cyber incident response planning, which could very well help you with other organizations that you're involved in. Um, what I will do afterwards is I will forward the link to Mike and then Mike can cascade that out to the committee. Uh, so if you have any interest, it's completely free. Um, it's free for all USI clients, employees, friends of USI. Uh, and so um, I do think it's important though because uh, that is one of the most significant threats that's out there today, as we all know. And um, that's uh, just an example of that one. But we will uh, obviously continue um, to look for ways to, to help you know, with education and training and go from there. So those are some of the main uh, things that I wanted to mention on, on this uh, session today. Any questions? I look forward to that. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, Chris. Chris, uh, Chris, can you can you send uh, an email uh, with the information on that? You know the. Absolutely. What I'm going to do is I have a flyer on that, Paul, and I will send that over to Mike O'Neill, and then he can cascade that or, or forward that over to the insurance committee members that are either on this session or those who were not able to attend. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Mike? Okay. Chris Monroe, you're on. Nice shirt. Uh, good evening, everybody. How are you? Um, good. My presentation is going to be very abbreviated, and I'll tell you why. Um, I came into tonight thinking that I would provide two things. Uh, an update to where we are year to date from a budget to actual expenditure standpoint. The second thing I wanted to do was update the previous renewal that I had presented last month. Um, I ran into the following roadblock. Generally speaking, I source claims from two sources. Um, obviously with our relationship through Cigna, I'll get Cigna active medical claims and I have those for the month of January. Um, I also get claims from Cigna's uh, or our pharmacy provider in Express Scripts, and I have those. Um, here's the challenge. We still have a relationship with Blue Cross on the dental, and we still have a relationship with Blue Cross on our over 65 medical uh, enrollees. Um, I generally have the Blue Cross claims by the 12th, 13th, 14th of the month. Um, they have not yet, yet released January claims. Um, I was supposed to have them on Monday, and then they released a update saying they're being delayed and I'm supposed to get them tomorrow. But long story short, it limits my ability to provide actual guidance or accurate guidance without having January claims. So my thought today was just to provide a little bit of a recap on where we are from a renewal standpoint. Um, last time we looked at the numbers based upon activity through December, um, we were looking at an increase in that 12 to 14% range. Um, what January does to that number, I don't know. Is it gonna take it from 14 down to six? No. Is it gonna take it from 14 to 19? No but it could move that needle two, three points that would be significant. You know, every 1% change is worth around $120,000. So having accurate information is important when it comes to me updating the budget. The one thing I will tell you is that the early claim numbers from Cigna um, are promising for the month of January. So I don't envision January claims doing anything but helping us, but uh, I won't have the ability to release that forecast for another day or two. Um, so again, unlike other year, years or meetings, I'd love to come in and say, all right, we're gonna rip through a bunch of different things, but uh, I'm kind of a little bit in a stranglehold not having those claims. Okay. Um, one last thing I would share with you, 
Um, when you look at where we are year to date, um, we have received, and Mike, thanks for passing that along, some information about rebate payments that Mike had sourced over the last couple of months. That's only going to help us in terms of where we are relative to budget. Um, again, not to prejudge January results, but uh, when you look at how things are rolling up, you know, six months in, we're probably looking at a three $350,000 budget surplus. Um, my hope is to be able to add to that based upon January results. But, um, but again, I'm a, a day or two away from having that. So um, from a where are we year to date, so far so good. Um, when it comes to uh, you know, earlier results uh, at this point in time. Um, last thing I'll share with you, and we're still trying to navigate through what's the right approach. Um, if you were to go back a month, uh, on January 15th, the federal government mandated coverage for over-the-counter test kits. And they announced the mandate on the 12th and uh, required carriers to make it operational by the 15th. So carriers didn't really have a lot of time to get it up and running. So the first option that they put in place on the 15th was the traditional go out, source it, pay for it, fill out a claim form and send it in. And that approach has been up and running since the 15th. The government encouraged them to also develop what they called a point of sale or a direct sourcing approach. And that what that would essentially mean is, hey, Tom goes to CVS, Tom goes to Walgreens, Tom shows his insurance card, he gets that test kit, Tom doesn't pay anything out of pocket, that gets sent in for adjudication and that becomes a claim that the town ultimately funds. Um, that was something that took all carriers about four weeks to get up and running. Um, Cigna is at that point, Express Scripts is at that point, Anthem is at that point where they're ready to launch that direct point of sale approach. All right. Um, here is the concern that I have, and we're still vetting through this. Um, anytime you make something free, Anytime you make something very easily accessible, you tend to drive concerns around over usage, hoarding, things of that line, nature. Um, if I'm at CVS and I see a test kit, why would I not grab one when I know it's not gonna cost me anything? And if I'm there with my wife, well, why wouldn't I grab a supply for her? If I'm there for my kids, why wouldn't I grab a supply for them? Um, we, had, we did a little bit of quick math and we were of the mindset that if 25% of our employees or our members went out and just got the test kits that they were allowed, you're looking at a $36,000 expense to the town and board each month. So we're talking real dollars here. So where do we go from here? Well, we could work with our pharmacy vendor to kind of shut that off, that direct approach, and simply allow people to rely on, get it, pay for it, send in a reimbursement. Um, it still gives people the ability to get the kits, um, but if they have to work a little bit harder, you might not see that, well, what do I care? It's free, I'm gonna grab it. So that was an issue that I first served up today. I heard back from the town, I'm still working with the board. The board seems to be wanting to endorse the concept of going out and getting that point of sale direct, show your insurance card and get it. So, you know, I've got to work through that with the town and the board, but I just thought it was important to bring up because, you know, these are kind of the cost ramifications of any of these, these federal mandates. And again, you're not talking a $3,500 cost per month, um, you're talking to 35,000. And it's gonna ebb and flow, as I said to, to my other clients, it's not 35,000 you know, a month. You know, People aren't gonna be out there getting it each and every month unless positivity rates start to go back up. But you know, I would think that there is a strong argument in the first three, four months where, hey, if I can get it, 
I'm going to get my hands on it. The real sadness in all of this is these things all have a shelf life. So it's not a question of let me get a kit and I know that kit will be good a year from now, 15 months from now. These things do have a shelf life. So, you know, the real fear and the real, you know, I don't want to say sadness, but the real disappointment in this is somebody goes out and grabs it and they end up throwing them in the garbage six months from now when the things lose their effectiveness because they've hit their expiration date. So again, I'll give you an update next time around, but um, that's, you know, the issue of the day, if you will, when it comes to the mandate and how we have to deal with the fallout. On the bright side, Chris, they're not going to be able to deliver enough of them anyway. So well, you know, so, money. Paul, somebody said the same thing. Somebody said your concerns are unwarranted because you can't get something for free that you can't get. Right. So, <laughs> you know, so it's I'm like touche, touche. But as is only the case, we'll be swimming in these things, you know, four months from now or five months from now. You put it on the same truck with the tuna fish. You know, <laughs> well, listen, I ordered, I got mine the, you know, uh, www.covidtest.gov. Yeah. And I was supposed to get it on January 28th. I'm still waiting. Still yeah. waiting. Who got theirs? Who got their uh, government? Who got theirs? But they expire March, March 1st. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, Tom, don't somebody say said, that. yeah, because they do have a Sounds real serious. Sport. They are they yeah, really? They, the expiration date is, yeah, I mean, they're pretty, um, in fact, I have it sitting here. Oh. Yeah. We, we ordered another another set for our Vermont house. We got those like a week after we sent it in. Yeah, expiration <laughs> March, March 2020. <laughs> 22, I'm sorry, 22. But that's, you know, really and, I, and I got it the first week of February, so. Yeah. But you know, it's probably a year after that. You know, like medicine. <laughs> With that, Chris, anything else? No, folks, I'm all set. Thank you. And again, I wish I had more to add, but um, you know, without those January claims, it's a little bit of you know one hand tied behind my back. Okay. So, just one thing, Chris. I apologize for um, going off there. Um, so do you see a, um, uh, so until you get the January claims in, you really can't speak to uh, rate increase or uh, uh, increases? Yeah, where we are now, Polly, the guidance I've given the town and the board is kind of a 12 to 14% increase. Okay. And once I have January claims is when we generally do our forensic let's go line by line let's kind of review the assumptions let's see kind of where we could tighten it up and then kind of let's get something that is somewhat close to i don't want to say a final budget but something that gets us closer you know as i've mentioned i try to be very conservative on the front end and then as we get closer to budget kind of tighten it up um, to make it its most accurate okay thank thank you very much yeah yep, no problem Okay, any other questions for Chris and Chris? Oh, no. Oh, well, I have a good question for Chris uh, W. Um, the, I was just thinking about it, and I wish I had thought about it earlier. I thought of this earlier. You were talking about um, the seminar on cyber, Chris. Um, would, is that something that might, I mean, since it's, it's probably one of the few things that we deal with that, that has a, a, a criminality to it, um, you know, some of the coverages that most of the coverages that we have, I mean, are really involved in a, in a criminal element where those are. Um, is that something that we should share with the, you know, with the, with the chief? And I mean, if he, maybe he has somebody that's his cyber expert that can attend this thing, or, I mean, would it be worthwhile or, I mean, it'd be another viewpoint on cyber, I'm, I'm guessing but I don't know what the specifics of the seminar, or maybe there's other seminars that would be helpful for somebody that's, um, that's gonna to have to be involved in a cyber attack if it happens in town from a, from a criminal standpoint. Right, now, it, it's a great point, Tom. I like how you're thinking. Um, I have not seen the details 
of this webinar just yet. So I don't know the content, but what I'm gonna guess is that it's probably more of an all industry kind of tied to the middle market size organization. So that can be a for-profit company, privately owned. That could be a not-for-profit. It could be a public entity. Um, there may be a little bit more of a tilt towards those industries that are that are more popular targets. So that could be healthcare, financial institutions, obviously public entities. Um, what I'm going to be doing, as I had said before, is I'm going to forward this right after this session closes over to Mike O'Neill. I'm actually going to copy Matt Kazaka as well. And in, in that, it will say, feel free to forward this to any colleague leaders, um, as well as you guys. And, and if you think there would be some value, then it would be great to attend. Um, what's interesting about law enforcement agencies is that in a lot of ways, they're very, very, very close to this because um, one, cybersecurity has become very close to law enforcement. Um, the police departments in, in a lot of ways are, are going to be notified when there is an incident along with the FBI and in some other regulatory bodies. So they absolutely will get an invite and you know it'll be up to them to decide whether um, they feel that they can they can do it but you know hopefully there will be at least a nugget of information something that might be a little bit relevant something that might be more modern um, that they can incorporate uh, into their own approach to managing yeah I mean is it a problem if we share these things with the with the uh, on the cyber with the police I mean I always we always used to my brother and I used to joke about my father cops things like cops think like cops and um you know so I mean a different perspective outside of, of you know the usual might add to you know might be helpful with their job and especially if it hits the town I mean you know we're all in it together so I mean, I'll leave it up to you and Mike to decide whether that's a, you know, whether that's, a, you know, there's, there's some advantage to sharing that and sharing these seminars with him. And, right. Uh, Absolutely. So I'll just throw that out there. And then you guys, uh, you know, as I said, I'll leave it to the two of you to make that decision. Well, decisions already made. That'll get over to them. I have a feeling that many people are probably in a good place. They're up to date. But um, as we all know, there are newer people. And there are more experienced people, and there are people that on the, uh, on the curve of knowledge, you know, which is always continual. Some people are a little bit ahead of other people, so this could very well be an opportunity, and uh, we'll definitely take your recommendation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, at least, at least it shows the chief that you know we are thinking about him. That's always yep. good because that's what he's looking for. <laughs> Okay. Especially when he pulls you over and you're in that speedy little car of yours. <laughs> you mean in the garage? <laughs> Dead battery? I don't even go there. I don't even go there. Okay. Frank, All right. Frank, uh, Frank, I'm sorry. I have to jump off. I have another meeting. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. The next meeting is March 17th at St. Patrick's Day. So, Any other questions? Any other comments? Any other business? We'll adjourn. Frank, I just one item. Uh, yes. I had uh, I just put it on the agenda to kind of get it into people's minds, the members. Um, the contracts that we have with USI with both Chris Monroe and Chris. Oh, I'm Monroe, sorry. Yeah, I, I missed that. Go ahead. Those are, those are three-year arrangements that will expire at the end of this fiscal year. That's this coming June 30th. Um, so as, as in the past, what, what this group has typically done is had a conversation about, uh, about the service and about, you know, it'd be the kind of thing we could do at the end of a meeting and ask, you know, Chris and Chris to jump off, you know, maybe at the next meeting and just talk about, um, you know, just about, we have options, you know, cause this is a professional service. The procurement policy doesn't require us to go out to bid every time when a contract is expired. Um, but that's something that should be considered. And typically this group has made a recommendation to the town manager and to the council uh, about the direction to go. And obviously would be involved if there was, if it was decided 
to uh, to go out to bid and to and to look at other firms. Yeah, Mike, I, I seem I've been through this a, a few times, and I believe that there are specific provisions in the charter for the insurance commission, insurance committee, that address our discretion as to whether we want to go out to bid or not. So. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because we yep. can uh, consider that. Did, did we say we're not having, we don't have a March meeting or we do, we've moved it to the. We're March 17th, St. Patrick's Day is the next meeting. Yeah. I, th I thought we moved it for some reason. Um, we, St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. March Madness. Oh, I, 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 I Mike, wasn't it your wife's birthday or something? Oh, yeah. it, it, it came up the night. My wife's birthday is in December. It was the December meeting, which which everyone very kindly. Oh, uh, okay. I, I know. I, I said it was a high holy day for, but you for brought, you brought, those I remember of us that of a certain you persuasion. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Never mind. Second, I just, second most important day of the year for me. All right. We, we can take it up. Uh, <laughs> well, let's just figure it out right now whether we're going to, who else is Irish? Oh, Tom Fitzpatrick. Oh, my God. They're all of you are Irish, looks like. It's every, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Frank, Frank you're badly. So we have, we have a majority. We have a majority. Uh, so, we can decide on that. If it really matters, I, I don't really want to push off these meetings because you know we're getting to the budget, we're getting to other things. It's at five thirty. I mean, we can yeah, no, get right to it. I what? we we've had it on St. Patrick's Day, just about you know half the time, as far as I can tell, it hasn't been a problem. Okay. We I think we should do it on St. Patrick's Day. That's fine. I, I, this is we I mean we we're off for the summer. We're coming up against the the budget. Um, renewal and the insurance renewals. So, uh, yeah, we're going to have it. Okay. If it feels better, you're certainly welcome to quaff uh, a Guinness or whatever your pleasure is. If it's Two remote. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, if it will be. If the background is blurred the for anyone and, you know, they're on mute the entire time, we'll, we'll have to question where they might be. Can I, can I zoom? Can I zoom from the Maple Cafe? <laughs> sure. Be on a yeah. phone. You can be on a phone. Okay. I will be. <laughs> okay. We're gonna, the meeting will be on the seventeenth at five thirty as usual. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other comments? No. I happen to find out that uh, a bulletproof vest for a dog ranges between seven hundred and fifty dollars. Up to nine hundred dollars for a class three A. I won't even talk about what that is. You can look it up. So I got a bug in my ear now. If you can't raise money for a dog in Weathersfield, you can't raise money anywhere, right? <laughs> I get the budget process. This is not part of our committee doing budget processes, but just that's my editorial for tonight. All right. So may I have a motion? I'm sorry. No, no. I say so moved. You say I make a motion. Go ahead. Okay. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. You want to be the next chair. That's what no, it is. No, no, no. I, I don't want to step on Paul's rise. <laughs> oh, please, Paul. <laughs> Okay, all well, stay don't want safe. To stand in your way. <laughs> okay, stay safe. See you next month. All right, have a great night. Take care.